to manage 60,000 uh, nodes in their clusters. Uh, this also means that uh, we uh, run about 1.8 million containers or part in the Kubernetes uh, world. And um, so we will kind of uh, show you how we achieve that. Um, of course, not everyone need that large of cluster, uh, but uh, for our cases, uh, we need a large cluster to manage uh, both VM and containers and other work nodes. So here's the agenda that we have prepared for, um, uh, for our talk. I will start with introduction and the background and, um, and tell you why we're doing this and what it is the Arcturus project. And then uh, Yin Huang will take over and uh, talk about more of the changes we've made to the Kubernetes and what optimizations we made at Kubernetes to achieve 60,000 uh, nodes in the clusters. Um, she will also show some of the performance test result and analysis. Um, hopefully, in the end, we have a time uh, to answer questions you may have. So with that, uh, uh, just give you some little bit of background, who are we, and then what is the Arctos project. So we are part of a cloud lab uh, at uh, FutureWay. And uh, FutureWay technology is a R&D organization that focuses on the open research, open innovation, open standard, uh, of course, the open source project. Uh, I'm currently leading the cloud lab. And uh, Yin Huang is, uh, is a principal cloud architect in our lab. Um, so by the name of the Cloud Lab, uh, we focus on how to manage, uh, to build and optimize the open, uh, the open source cloud uh, software or cloud open source uh, projects such as Kubernetes, uh, OpenStack, and Kata containers. So we do a lot of Kata containers on that. Um, one of the projects that we, uh, we did a couple of years ago uh, is called Centaurus uh, project. Uh, Centaurus project is a Linux Foundation cloud infrastructure project. Uh, we donated to uh, Linux Foundation around December 2020, so it's one and a half years old. Uh, but internally, we actually started the project uh, since beginning of 2019, so it's kind of three years old. Um, so today, the Centaurus project consists of uh, a group of sub-projects, and uh, the first project is called Arctos, and that's the project we mainly focus on today uh, in this talk. And Arctos is a uh, large-scale computing uh, cluster management systems for that, and we will talk more on this. The second project is MISA. Uh, MISA is a network project we call Cloud Network Project uh, based on the eBPF and XDP technology. Uh, we, uh, MISA is, we're using this to support the network uh, configuration, network uh, provisioning for the Arctos. We have actually have two sessions uh, related with uh, MISA, and uh, one is tomorrow, and one is uh, on Thursday. If you're interested in those two sessions, you can search, uh, look up the uh, schedule uh, by name of MISA. We have two sessions about that. The other two projects are on the Centaurus project group, and it's, uh, one is for AI and the one is for Edge, and those are kind of out of scope for this talk. But if you're interested in to the Centaurus the project as a whole, and you can go to a website called centauruscloud.io, and where we have a bunch of information there for you to available. Uh, we also have a booth uh, in, on the first floor, so if you are interested in Centaurus as a whole, you can um, uh, go there, and we have a demo for you to see, uh, to build a, a Centaurus cluster and manage uh, the VMs and the containers. So why we are doing the Centaurus project and uh, and what is Arctos project at all. So in fact, this is mainly driven by the, our current uh, infrastructure platform challenges. And um, as many companies, we're using customized OpenStack to manage the VMs, and we're using Kubernetes to manage or orchestrate the container-based uh, applications. However, we encounter uh, some scalability issues for both platforms. There are two challenges that can stand out that get us to working on this uh, Centaurus project. And the first one is we, want to ma uh, we have a challenge to manage a cluster. We want to manage a cluster that are more than uh, 10,000 uh, computer nodes in a cluster. Um, minimal on that. Uh, it's just that we, we 
Today, our current platforms manage 1,000 and 2,000 computer nodes per cluster. Now, for our public cloud services, we offer a couple of public cloud services, and uh, that we have to deploy and manage a lot of OpenStack clusters. And of course, this is a high, uh, high, um, high, high um, uh, cost to us for management perspective. Now, the second challenge we have, uh, we have a customer ask us to provision more than 5,000 VMs within uh, three or four minutes. And we can't do this with our current platform. And that's where it get us started. Okay, we need to build a new platform or unify the platforms uh, for that. So that's where we're getting started to this entire us. Now, secondly, we also want to manage, uh, unify our platforms for, to manage VMs, our platforms to manage containers, our platforms to manage serverless. We want to combine into one. Um, not only that we reduce the cost, uh, but also driven by a customer request that where they want to deploy hybrid applications onto the, with a single API, which we cannot uh, do that today with our current uh, platforms. We currently we have actually three platforms for each of this. Platform for VMs, platform containers, platform serverless. Um, uh, when, I say, when I say a hybrid application, I mean that um, the application is designed so that part of the application or components, for example, like backend, they're running in dedicated VM. And part of the applications or components running as a container or web assembly, you know, start have people using web assembly, they can be run anywhere. So uh, they want to do this, deploy this hybrid application in one single API or one shot, which we cannot do that today. And so that's the, uh, become a goal of, for our um, CentOS project. Uh, additionally, we have a customer expressed the interest that they don't want to manage a Kubernetes cluster. And uh, it's become very complicated. Uh, people that we experience, it become very popular, everybody knows it, but it's become very, very complicated. They don't want to manage the, uh, the cluster themselves, uh, but they want to use the API to manage orchestrated application. And uh, you know, this is a declared API, very easy for customer to use. For that means that for us, we have to build a truly multi-tenant Kubernetes and uh, provide isolation to the customers if multiple customers, multiple tenant using the same cluster. We have to provide that uh, isolations uh, in current Kubernetes standard that we actually don't support it. And um, last but not least, um, they're driven by our AI platform for coordinated uh, ML trainings for federated AI trainings, uh, whatever it is, uh, they require us, they require platform to manage the nodes, not only in the cloud, but also on the edge, so that they can push the AI training job uh, to on the, in the cloud or on the edge, and it depends on the, the scenarios, the applications. So that become a goal for the CentOS project as, uh, also. So that's a high level of why we're doing this project and some of the background we're doing this. Now, let me uh, kind of uh, a little bit of the arc to the project itself. Um, as I mentioned, the, on the CentOS project, and Arctos is for compute, we call compute project, that uh, we call a, a cloud infrastructure platform for manage very large scale compute clusters and orchestrate different type of applications. Um, it's based on Kubernetes, and we drive uh, from the Kubernetes, but we make a, a lot of fundamental change, uh, design change, and architecture change to Kubernetes, and the result of that is Arctos. So Arctos the project is, uh, is based on the Kubernetes. I won't go through each of the uh, bullet points, uh, because I will talk about each of this high level change that we made uh, in the following slides. The fourth is, fourth is uh, Arctos scale out architecture. Uh, here is a well known, everybody knows Kubernetes architecture, uh, where you have API server, you have ETCD, and they store all the objects that are created by the customers. And then uh, you have a scheduler running, right? The schedule allocated which part is running on the which node. And then you have a, then you have a bunch of uh, controllers uh, running to uh, finish your uh, deployment or finish your workflows. And of course, you also manage a, a list of the nodes in the, uh, in the clusters. We take this architecture and then we split it into two parts. And the first part we call uh, tenant partitions, TP, tenant partition. And uh, that partition has its own API server, ETCD running, and, uh, but only store the tenant related objects. So 
it has most of the controller running, uh, like a replicate controller and a, a jobs, a daemon set, or a stable, uh, stable uh, replica set. So that's uh, the uh, we call tenant partitions. And that's the partition where you receive the request from the customer for deployment, uh, for deployment uh, or orchestrate the application. Now the second part of the split is uh, res we call resource partitions, called RP, where it doesn't have any schedule running, but it has its own API server. It has its own uh, etcd, only store the resource-related objects. In this case, many is the node. So you running only the node controller within that partitions. Uh, so you manage up on the node, a lot of the node information. So all the node steps you will back, report back to that API server of that partition, not the TPs. So that's actually that's the high level uh, idea of uh, the scale out architecture we call it is split the partitions to the two. Of course, there are many ways you can do the uh, increase the scalability of Kubernetes, uh, but we talk this way because uh, we want to uh, we want to build a platform that manage not only uh, the containers but also VMs and are able to scale more than uh, 50,000 uh, uh, computer nodes. So uh, in Huang, actually, we'll uh, talk about more about how the detail, how this is designed, and then uh, on the optimization we made to it. So that's actually very simple at a high level. Of course, there's a lot of detail to figure out, and Huang Yin will share some of the detailed information uh, with you. The second uh, made, the change we made in the Kubernetes, and it now becomes a part of Arctos, is multi-attendance. Uh, multi the first thing we did, we uh, introduced tenant concept, uh, introduced the tenant objects or tenant controllers. So now, before any customer using those shared clusters, uh, Arctos clusters, they have, we have to create a tenant for them. We have to create a registered tenant for them. Um, so when you create a tenant, uh, we create a, a space, quick one logical space. So on that space, all the objects created by the tenant will be in that uh, in that tree of the objects they store in the ETCD. So this is how we so how we isolate the resource between the tenants. And so we provide resource isolation for the tenants. Uh, we also add a, a metadata field called tenant uh, to almost all the objects in the in the Kubernetes. That means including the pod. So in the pod, when you deploy a pod or an application now, you have to specify which tenant it is. And that will dis, uh, distinguish you, that pod, with different pod. And similarly, we also introduced the network concept and the network CRD and the network controllers uh, for the network isolation. And most of you already know that uh, in the network design in standard Kubernetes, it's a flat network. Every part in the clusters can talk to any other part. Um, of course, you can, uh, by default, of course, you can use network policies to specify which part can talk to which part, but by default, they can talk to each other because they are on the same IP range. So we change the model, and we introduce the network objects, so we allow tenant to create their own network, and each tenant can create as many networks as they have. So each network has its own IP address, has its own um, uh, a DNA is a server. So when you create a pod, now you have to specify which network it is uh, within the we're located in that network. So by default, different network, different tenant uh, by definition, because they are not in the same IP range, so they don't talk to each other. And that's how we isolate uh, from network perspective the pod communications, which provide more strong isolation than the network policy. Of course, within the each network policy, you still can use a network policy to specify which part of target which part. So the uh, third uh, major change we made uh, to support the uh, unified systems uh, we call the uh, runtime infrastructure. So we, we kind of abstract the part concept further to include in VMs. Now we have a VM part and the container part in the future, we plan to support, like, uh, uh, for example, uh, WebAssembly. So we're able to support WebAssembly part. So that, uh, with that, in the part definition, now all the uh, Kubernetes scheduler, controllers, and all workflows, they just work with VM as, as well. So you can just orchestrate the VM just like a containers. Um, but in order to do that, and you have to make a change to unify the runtime on the node agent side, so on the node side. 
So we extend the node uh, agent to not only support the container runtime, we also support the, uh, the VM runtime. So we add a VM runtime support on every node, on the node agents. And that's where we're able to unify this. But that's transparent to the customer. We extended uh, CRI, the container runtime interface, to including a lot of the fail that VM required. Uh, so we, uh, we extend that, 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 that interface to run that. We also introduced some of the uh, action objects, and then that's also new for the containers, uh, for the VMs. Um, you could, because you can do uh, some of the operations on VM. Uh, for example, you can bootstrap a VM, you can make a snapshot for the VMs, you can detach or attach a device to the VMs. Those are not available for containers. So we have to introduce that. Uh, the what we call action objects. So customer can manage the VM and uh, through the, through the uh, Kubernetes uh, API uh, perspective. So that's the actually main change we made uh, to the uh, Kubernetes. And again, result is the Arctos uh, project and uh, able to manage uh, uh, 50,000 or 60,000 uh, uh, computer nodes in their clusters. So uh, with that, I think I will hand this over to Ying Huang. She will talk about more about you know, how we make the change, how we support assisting uh, thousand nodes per clusters. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Xiong, for the introduction. Um, OK, so I'm going to talk about how we scale out Actos. It's actually our scale architecture based on top of Kubernetes and what kind of optimization we have made to make the cluster to be able to manage 60,000 nodes. So this is the architecture for Kubernetes. We are already very familiar. That Dr. Sean already showed that before. And this is the same. And we split it out to two partition, tenant partition and resource partition. So resource partition is specialized at managing nodes. So we can see here it has its dedicated ETCD and API server. Kubernetes talks to API server in its own resource partition. So it reports its node healthiness. So we leverage resource partition to manage the node healthiness of the cluster. And in the tenant partition, we are only focusing on customer workload. It has its own ETCD instance API server, and it has a scheduler. Scheduler gets pulled information, the customer request, from the API server of the tenant partition, and it gets the node information from the API server of the resource partition. And then it determines which port it want to put on which host. So by this way, also Kubernetes in the resource partition, it reports its node healthiness to its API server in its own partition, the resource partition. And it also downloads the port assignment to its particular host from the API server of the tenant partition. So this way, we successfully split out the request uh, different uh, workload management by the nature. We separate the node management request to resource partition and uh, the customer request to tenant partition. So the relationship between the tenant partition, resource partition, they are many to many, and they can scale independently. So, and uh, for now, we support uh, multiple tenant per tenant partition. But right now, we are not supporting cross tenant partition tenant. So each tenant uh, has to belong to one tenant partition. What's the benefit? So tenant partition, we call it TP. Resource partition, we call it RP. So they have more specific workload. And we are focusing, they have their own focus of workload where easier to make individual performance improvement in different partition. And uh, they are independent from each other. What is benefit brings from? They can scale independently. We can have 10 TP partition and only one or two or three resource partition. 
and uh, each tenant partition, they actually can take all the resources from multiple resource partition. So arbitrary scale, we have, can potentially make one tenant partition to take uh, multiple, all the resources from multiple resource partition, as long as we were able to handle this workload in a single tenant partition. Okay, in addition, each of the tenant partition have its own scheduler. And the scheduler work independently in, in its own tenant partition. So they can provide multiple system throughput. Okay. So we have done some optimization, mainly focus on several areas. We're trying to eliminate the unnecessary ETCD reads from API server. We're trying to regulate client list operation. We will tell you why this is important later. And we also did the improvement on the watch mechanism. So for those of you who are familiar with Kubernetes, list and watch is a very important operation in Kubernetes. And it also becomes a major bottleneck of the performance. So we will present our improvement with the performance test result together. First of all, we, this, this is our, uh, what we're going to talk about, the performance data, the benchmark tools we're using, and the critical changes we have made for performance improvement. First, this is our final performance data. Arctos 1.0.9 and compare with Kubernetes 1.21. So the first nine tell us the cluster size, how many number of worker nodes we are managing during our performance test. The second nine tells how we partition this cluster. So the first number is tenant partition, second number resource partition. So in our 1.0, we were able to go to 60,000 nodes by three tenant partition, three resource partition. And before that, uh, we tried the arbitrary number of combination for tenant, uh, for TP and RP, and trying to see what's a good combination and how we can reduce our management cost. The third line, the pod creation request rate during the test, there are two numbers. So the first number and second number. So who, for whoever is familiar with the perf test tool, there are two phases during the perf test. The first phase is called the saturation pod creation phase. So it's in this phase, it's trying to use a large number of small pod trying to take over uh, to make the cluster reach full capacity, meaning 30 pods per host. And on the second part, it uses small number of, relatively small number of pods, but each pod, they take a lot of system resources. So it's guaranteed almost one host can only host one pod in the latency test phase. So the first QPS is the request we are sending per second for the saturation test phase. The second number is the request rate we are sending in the latency test phase. So in Kubernetes, the default test QPS is 20 and 5. So in the saturation test phase, they create 20 pods per second. In the latency test port, they create 5 uh, pause per second. We actually, during our test, we are saying this QPS is very important in the actual latency data they are reporting. So meaning the more number you are created during the test, the higher latency you are getting, which is not as ideal as because we want to support a big cluster, you are supposed to get more customer, right? So you cannot uh, have a very low QPS when your customer is growing. So, um, so the latency port, startup latency data here, we have P50, 90, and 99. 
those is just a number for the latency, uh, latency port when we create. It's in the second phase because this is a criteria used by Kubernetes first test tool to determine whether the their uh, saturation test uh, uh, is successful, the latency test, whether it's successful. So they use the five second as a standard, but we are have our we have some, some number is higher, some number is lower, but roughly as long as it's around that five seconds, we think it's a successful test case. So from this, say you can say we using, for Actos, after we scale out and after our server optimization, we have much better QPS and the relatively comparable port startup latency. Okay. So um, the benchmark tools we're using, we use the building KubeMark uh, to simulate uh, the real cluster because the real cluster of 50K, it's very expensive. So the, for the hollow node, uh, it's used 0.1 CPU for each uh, node. So we were able to reduce the size, but in the real test, we use 505 number of machine to do our 50K node simulation. So, and we adopt this Kubernetes perf test tool because we need to make some changes. It's, uh, it's the industrial standard perf test tool from Kubernetes. It's called Cluster Loader 2. Um, there are many tools, but this is the one we're using. It's from Kubernetes, uh, Google, so um, I, if you need an explanation, please let me know. So um, we have, have to make some changes to cluster loader tool. So first, uh, because we support multi-tenancy in Actos, so we have to make some changes, which enables us to, for each, uh, our uh, test, for each tenant partition, we use a, a one separate proof test process so that uh, we reduced the impact that if your uh, perf test tool is slow, you cannot have high throughput in your actual cluster. Okay, so we use multiple test process um, and we increase our QPS. So after increasing, you can see the total amount of running time is reduced to like 15% of the original runtime, which hugely saving our testing cost. You know, the, the money you spend on Google, GKE is huge if you have to run those tests again and again. And we have to make minor changes to the perf test tool because we detect there's some like a customer introduced issues just for the perf test tool. So that's why we're, we're calling it like regulate the customer behavior for this part, okay. So we did several critical changes based on our observation. So the observation is some factors that affect our Kubernetes performance. First, read and write from and to ETCD, it's big impact. And the least large amount of data from API server, it also have huge impact. So most of our changes are around this area. So there are some data. First of all, this is a change ported from Kubernetes. So I want to mention that uh, because this gives some indication how we should perform those performance improvement. So we ported from Kubernetes because when we, this change was not there before we fork Actos out of Kubernetes. So they introduced this change later after we fork it out. So during our test, well, this test is uh, performed on one TP1 RP with QPS 105. Um, so here's the cluster size. Before this change, you can, for this, 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 this latency number, it's, it's impossible for us to claim we are supporting 50K cluster, okay? And uh, after this changes, for 15K, we are below the bar of successful run, and we were able to go further. We increased the cluster size to 25K after this change. So this is the latency data. Um, sorry, 
This is uh, the changes uh, in the node controller. It uses watch instead of list for port. So we, as we already said, the least large amount of data is a huge performance impact, and especially for pods. We know pods has the most uh, number of objects. So uh, it reduces the list of pods by 15%, and this is the improvement, the performance, performance improvement we got. Um, so from that, we're encouraged. So we did our own optimization. So we make some changes to Kubernetes. In Kubernetes, when it's trying to patch, it always reads, I mean, in the original Kubernetes, or always trying to read first, trying to get the latest uh, node version so that it can patch. But we said you are consistently watching uh, node. You, are not, you don't necessarily need to read it again. So we just use the watched node to do the patch. And, uh, Using our uh, observation, there's almost no conflict. So again, on the so with the one TP one RP twenty five K, so now we are able to support one fifty fifty twenty five K. So the latency has improved about twenty uh, percent, right? So the get get nodes, this is a count that we were able to reduce the number of gets because our change was saying if you patch field because of the confliction, you will have to read and then patch. But uh, so the get is this number means there's almost in, in our test, there's no confliction. So it makes sense to use watch data to just do the patch. So third one, so we, as we said, the perf test tool is have some issue. During its latency test time, it does a list per pod it's trying to create. So there's a whole bunch of lists. So instead of doing that, we said you should just use use one list. Don't do the particular list, just do a general list and you watch from there. So we were able to reduce, uh, uh, because of this list is actually relatively small because it's only this particular part are signed to this node, right? So it's very small. However, it still have the large number of lists also have big performance impact. So by reducing this, we were able to go to below um, around five seconds for our P99. So this is 25K. Uh, cluster. So now we can claim we support 25K for our single cluster by one TP, one RP. Then we go further, we want to do two TP, two RP, see whether can we support a bigger number. Um, so before this is a change, we did some watch optimization for this. Um, before that, it's like right after we made the first uh, previous optimization, we were able to support 25K by one TP, one RP. So we increase the cluster to two TP, two RP and goes to 50K nodes. Um, of course, we have doubled the QPS, right? So, and we see at this point, our before P99 is relatively high. It's comparing to the standard of perf test. We, we cannot say we support uh, this big cluster, right? So we're looking, say, what is the problem? What is blocking us from supporting 50K node? So here we give you this watch, event watch optimization. What is that? Why it has a big performance improvement after this change? Here. OK. So I'm not sure, uh, this is a watch mechanism in API server. How many of you are not familiar with this? Should I explain further or just, uh, or, I, or I will start from this, my, my, okay. So if you have questions, please raise your hand. So for Kubernetes, list and watch. So we know that uh, each watch has to be, it only have a lifetime of several minutes. After several minutes, it renew its watch connection, okay? When it start to watch, it has to provide a resource version 
it is one to watch from. Okay, so when the API server gets this resource version, so it will scan its event cache and find what is the event you are the resource version one you are watching from to our latest resource version. So we call it RV two right now. So it has all those events there, and uh, not all those events should be sent to the client. So it goes to the event processor and use the watch predicates to determine whether this events need to be sent to the client. Why this is a problem? It's because in the client, it only uses the event latest resource version to update the, the resource version it's maintained. So if it does not get any new events, it will keep using its old resource version. So when, we, when our cluster goes bigger and uh, the chance of each node get a pod or get an event is very slim. So there's a long period of time that you are not getting any new events. So your, event, your resource version gets older and older. And then your init events are going to bigger and bigger. It will cause the API server CPU time to scan and filter out all those events. Right? So by, by put, uh, solving this problem, we introduced uh, a bookmark event. So this is not new. Bookmark event is already supported by Kubernetes. In this client library, it will say, if I get a bookmark event, I'm only use this event's resource version to update the resource version I'm maintaining. So which means in the next watch session, when it's trying to renew its watch session, it will use a newer version. So by using, we give it the latest RV, goes to the client, and the next time we will renew, it's use a higher, it's much newer resource version so that uh, we have successfully reduced the number of init events it has to scan. Okay? So uh, I hope this is clear. Uh, so from the log, and the uh, API server has this kind of log, it tells that uh, it's a big number of init events it's processing, it takes this much CPU time. And before this change, you, API server has uh, this number of uh, init event uh, processing uh, freakout <laughs> log. And after this change, we were able, we cannot get rid of them. It's about, uh, say, like 20-30% uh, left. But uh, this number, look at the profiling of the API server, the CPU profiling. Uh, so before the change, it takes 62% of CPU time in our sampling time to process this event. And after this change, it's less than 19% of CPU time. So any questions? Yes? No, this is a single change. This is a very small change in API server. So because we use the same code base for our uh, TP and RP API server, we use the same code base. So they both get this updated. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a small change in API server, watch, catch, processing. Uh, process. You don't need to change your client. There's no need to change that. I'm sorry, can you say that again? The, um, the, the perf test is mainly just creating pods. It's not doing other Perf things. test is a separate client, right? Yeah. It's just uh, ta using uh, some kind of client library to say I want to create a pod. It, uh, it may use the watch client, may not. So if it's using watch client, it's a benefit from that. If it doesn't use watch client, then it uh, it's just like uh, it's benefit. The beneficiary is mostly in Kubernetes. 
because Kubernetes is the one that gets this watch renewal and there's a lot of immersive init event processing. The benefit is actually the change is being done in API server. We see this improvement. So API server has much better performance. It's, it's not heavily loaded because it's trying to process a unique event. So the, the, from the client perspective, the client will have less latency when it's trying to renew the watch. It's actually all the client, every client should be benefit from this. Yes. Uh -huh. But then in the, in the performance test, since it was being tested as part of the main client that's benefiting from it, it's a good thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But there's two API servers because the pods come from the TP. Yes. And then the nodes come from, a, uh, from the RP, yes. And the Kubernetes actually talks to both. The Kubernetes talks to both. Yes. So because this is a connection, again, going back, this is a watch to API server. So API server will have much better processing time, and client will have much uh, faster response time. So, so then here is our performance improvement. We were able to reduce the P99 by 70%. Um, it's not there. It's not designed. It's not designed uh, this way. So, so this bookmark event thing. What I'm saying is like uh, the client library. It has some logic saying I'm gonna ignore this event. I'm gonna ignore its object. I'm only gonna use its resource version. So that logic is already in Kubernetes. But they did not, in this case, it did not send the extra because they think this is an extra. This may not be relevant to the client. So we're saying this in, in the sense of resource version, it's relevant. But his point is, we can contribute back to the Kubernetes. Yes, of course. It's, it's it seems like easy. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's just, uh, you know, Kubernetes have a long way for code review, PR, yeah. and those that's things. <laughs> yeah, that's a process. Uh, uh, this, is, this is a very, I, I, I personally think it's a very good improvement. We can contribute that. And uh, if we have time and money, we would want to see how per Kubernetes got improved after this, right? We want to do... Per further perf test after this change for Kubernetes as well. Okay. Um, okay, again, this is our final performance data. Now we claim that we support 60,000 nodes cluster with real performance test data. With the three TPs and three RPs. Three TPs, three RPs. So, so by this five TP, five RP, you can tell that uh, because uh, each, in, each additional TP and RP will have more management cost, right? You have more ETCD, more API server. So that means the more money you want to pay, you higher throughput you will get. Okay, so yeah. Um, there are some like uh, CPU data. Uh, this is Kubernetes CPU data. And it's, it's not very obvious, but we can see that the CPU utilization is around 40 or 45 percent. And our uh, TP, uh, uh, first of all, the, the CPU utilization for our TP here is around 35 percentage. And the, the jump here is because when we tear it down, we use a very high QPS to tear it down because we don't care about the performance at that time. So it uses a lot of CPU, but uh, it shouldn't uh, uh, affect our performance test. Um, and this is for our P CPU usage. It is below, I'm sorry, this is below 20%, which means our RP capacity have good potential to grow. Okay? So main takeaway, scale out architecture is 
one of the most fundamental things we have made changes and it's built a solid base for our big cluster. And uh, this operation is very expensive. Try everything, change your uh, master uh, component, trying to use as less list as possible and regulate your client behavior. Don't let them to list arbitrarily. And event watch proof is very critical. This is a big change. Uh, it's, it's actually a small change, but a big improvement we have got. So our, our goal next, we want to support over 100,000 nodes per cluster. By further reduce ETCD rates, maybe making some changes for the API server, uh, control plane components, and we do further API server profiling. So, and also thinking outside of Kubernetes. Okay, so there are some references. And uh, any questions? No, it doesn't need to be equal. You can have one tenant partition and multiple resource partition, or one resource partition, multiple tenant partition. Depends on your API server load for different partition. Okay. Do you know what has, we find out that one RP partition, resource partition, can support 25,000 nodes, uh, or 25,000 nodes? Yeah. Actually, the, we have 30K but the performance is uh, a bit lower, official. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not official, it's official, yes. Uh, I'm not familiar with area, but I wonder, like, when there's multiple uh, cities and multiple RPs, then why do we still call it one cluster? How, so how is one cluster defined? It's because uh, your customer can potentially use up all the resources you cross multiple resource partition, right? And yeah. also our cloud provider, they want to support multiple tenant. They want a unified management part. They, they don't, uh, initially it's a, it's a for, for management perspective, it's a single cluster. Yeah, it's a single cluster, the way you can run multiple RP or TPs, tenant partitions. We set up an API gateway free in front of it. So it's one endpoint for the customers to deploy the application. Um, and each TP using all the resources across. So uh, they, they, each TP have a scheduler, and I mentioned that. And the scheduler knows all the nodes from all the resource partitions. So in that in that perspective, it's one cluster. Not only the logic and physical analytics, um, because you cannot take part away from that. Um, I think the other, the other part of the question you have is mean that uh, there's a lot of ways to do this scale out architectures. Um, some people deploy multiple Kubernetes clusters and then risk federation day. Uh, we find that some challenges for that. Uh, one, because this, this, uh, each cluster, they have own node management. They don't, we can leverage each other's. Uh, that's one. The second one is if customer deploy application across multiple clusters, the communication between those clusters is pretty complicated. Uh, of course, there are solutions there, but it's very complicated for that. So we kind of take this approach uh, to see how it goes. And so I think they said we they talk, they, they said it stopped. So it's not a, we can answer questions here, right? Are we not? We, we can still answer questions here. Uh, we're out of time. We're out of time. Yes, but uh, okay. So uh, one more question I have, then we 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 stop. Yeah. 